Is there anybody around? Okay. Don't worry about this. Just, but I just, have just make sure she's in front of me. Well, your Toastmaster at the box, that's for sure. Okay. Well, could everybody first move up so we're like all together here? That's okay, I can have so we'll it. Oh, we'll leave you just as comfortable in the front, I promise you. And more fun because you're gonna, I'm going to be asking you to talk to each other. So. Okay. Why don't we do this right now? Yeah. Because I'm going to be good to sit next to someone. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so you're going to talk to each other. It's going to be a friendly talking. All right, well, welcome everybody. This is the Listen Up session, and I'm personally very excited to be able to hear about it. Um, I care very much about communication. My name is Ann Lawrence, and I'm with an A.N. Hewitt Toastmasters Club 897901. And our presenter today is Joanne Telser Freire. Um, my Spanish is better than my French. And Joanne is co director of CogFit Quest Limited, and she's a cognitive fitness speaker and a cognitive fitness program developer and trainer. Her interests include training, speaking, reading, traveling, cultural differences, music, animals, and languages. And with all of that, I believe she has all of that because she's lived around the world she, and uh, worked, lived and worked in Pakistan, Egypt, Care, and France, and has, a, um, has done a lot of international work, journalistic work um, in Doha, Qatar, with newspaper, radio, and TV, program creation for French business people needing to work in English, and teacher training. She's currently developing, developing an exciting new program for brain fitness, and she's the sponsor and mentor of the new club Francophile Bilingual Toastmasters in Chicago from a vision in 2010 to reality in 2012. And so welcome the president of the Francophile Bilingual Toastmasters of Chicago, uh, the president, vice president membership, vice president of PR, area governor for English speaking clubs in France, and the division <laughs> governor for France, Luxembourg, and Belgium. Fast. Welcome. You. Oh, I'm going to take that out because maybe we'll get a computer and maybe we won't. But when you're a Toastmaster, you always have to be ready for anything. So I'm ready. And you don't need to take notes because I have a handout for you. But you may, if you want to, you can. My presentation is called Listen Up. And what I want to ask you first is when you make a presentation, how much do you think about your message? A lot. How much do you think about, will the audience get your message? That's the first, one of the big problems. Do you ever think about what might get in, in the way of that? Well, for me, there are a lot of things, and that's one of the things I'm going to ask you to reflect on today. I have a really funny slide that you can't see, so I'm going to describe it to you. There's a dog, a little dog, and it's got its ears, and it's going up. So listen up. Mm -hmm. That was really funny. And maybe we'll get a computer and you can see it. <laughs> but if not, today I'm going to ask you to reflect on two things. What are the obstacles to comprehension? And what are different ways of listening? So two kind of different ideas. One, when you're the speaker and you have people in the audience, what are their problems understanding you? And when you're the listener, what are the different ways and things you have to listen for and about? Jerry, do you have a computer in there? No. In your bag? Oh, well. Mine just died. So we may or may not have one later. So first, the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is see how many people are here. Three, four, five, six, seven, nine. Thank you very much, by the way, for coming to an afternoon session after all of the obligatory sessions are over. I would like you to get into two groups, two groups of ten, of five, <laughs> and make. I'm going to give you a few minutes to make a list of all the reasons that you can come up with of why you think people may have difficulties understanding each other. And then we'll come back. I'd like to hear what you come up with, and I'll share my ideas with you. So we have. So that's why I asked you to sit close to each other. So you're still going to have to move or turn around and get in two groups of five. So here we have four, maybe one more. Okay. So we'll have, oh, you're going to do it too. So we'll have five and six. And uh, assign one person to, to make the list. And just brainstorm. I'll give you about maybe three minutes to come up with as many I, ideas that you have about why, what are the difficulties people have an understanding of each other. What are the things that, uh, 
that, that cut off that communication. Why don't you come over here, Jim, because there's six and six. Who's recording? So you got three minutes. And I'll tell you, I came up with ten, so if you can come up with more, I'll be really happy. Noise as you want. Can we yell, Joanne? You can yell and shout and scream and laugh. Yeah, I'm gonna keep trying to make this going. Accents, unclear message, directing gestures. Somebody in the past has been ostracized for some reason or more wheels. They don't really want to listen. They don't fit in. Outside of more vocal variety. Yeah. Distraction. There could also be outside distraction. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. We're thinking imagery. People have different images, like different sirens and mm -hmm. yeah. people get distracted by other people setting trends or something. Yeah. Many times when people things they interpret what they're hearing differently than what somebody else next to them. Must interpretation. Really interpretation. something else that's going on in their life that's distracting them. Personal yeah. emotions. Cell phone. Personal emotions. 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 Presentation. Like presentation as a whole. Yeah. 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 A message that is not something you're receptive to. It could be sales, it could be religion, it could be yeah, something that is that you put up defenses against. Volume, sound, volume. And I think it's just dead. How about like biases? Isn't there some things about like cultural or mm -hmm. things like that that you might have some biases where you won't um, super personalize the questions? How would you describe a message that you're not interested in? Sounds like sort of lack of subject matter. Monotone, boring. That was another message. Force the person to qualify the person talking to you to really figure out what they're interested in what they're talking about. Lack of interest. We're actually here because we're interested, right? So we're attentive to the message. Yeah, building on what Jim said, it's really not the message that they're interested in. The trust. Okay, you have one more minute. I'm giving you one more extra minute. So because we actually I'm good to go. Trust and credibility is trust in the relationship. Yeah. I'm from the same line, if you don't mind. Yeah. I got you read them. <laughs> but think about how much you want to listen to somebody when they get interviews and you're like, wow, this person, somebody got one for years and killed like this, yes. you know, like Rose. Like, like President Obama, who would you yeah. listen to him or some schmuck office? Depends on your religion and your political affiliation. Yes, I apologize. No, I'm an Obama fan, uh, but it turns out one of my. Paul is saving the day. I am so grateful. Yay! Give him a ribbon. I give them. I, I don't, don't have, have any ribbons in my head. Hey, Joanne, I think you've got a different session on there, though. I did. It's right there. No, no, no. Thanks, Jerry. We're I'm glad that you thought of that. <laughs> any others? Okay. I did pretty well. Yeah.
I have other stuff on here too in case we get bored. I can do great trainings on here. Accents, unclear message, jargon, distracting gestures, mannerisms, regional expressions, monotone, unintentional, boring, or vocal variety, outside distractions, mumbling, personal emotions, no eye contact, unorganized, not subject matter, lack of specificity, no passion, unreceptive messages, and he's about sales policy. I thought I had a bias. Isn't it open in this? Lack of personal message, lack of trust. So should I close this? Well, what we can do is start, you can start telling me what you found. So maybe we need a spokesperson from each group? We can go first. Okay. We have, we have more than ten. Okay. Oh, they have more than ten. Okay. So I better write down the ones I don't have for my next well, I can, presentation. I can work this out and give it to you. Let me see what's on the back side. Oh, that's okay. I'll take notes. All right. Accents. Unclear message. Jargon. Mm -hmm. Distracting gestures or mannerisms. Regional expressions. Mm -hmm. um, monotone, uninteresting, boring. Can you hear her, Jerry? Yeah. Okay, just check. There you go. Yay. Okay. Poor vocal variety. Thanks, Paul. You're Poor, welcome. So what was it? What you had? Um, monotone and in, in, monotone. Yeah. Poor vocal variety. That's what you saying. Yeah. It? Outside distractions like cell phones, fire trucks. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. Thank you, Paul. Mumbling. Mumbling. Maybe some personal emotions, like you're sidetracked about something else. Like when your technical stuff doesn't work. <laughs> or like your kids in the hospital or whatever. Um, no eye contact. We, so we had like a lot of like Toastmaster type things. Uh -huh. Unorganized message, lack of subject matter, lack of specificity, no passion. Um, maybe you're unreceptive to the message, so it's like a something you're not interested in from a sales perspective mm -hmm. or if it's a different political affiliation or a different religion. Maybe you have some kind of personal bias. Uh -huh. Good ideas. Um, lack of interest in the message. Lack of trust or credibility. And maybe somebody has a hearing issue, or there's mm -hmm. some kind of technology issues that are preventing that hearing from happening. There we go. Sounds pretty good. Did you guys find any more? Well, any yes. other ones? I think we have a few, but uh, one might feel like an outsider. Mm -hmm. uh, imagery might be getting in the way. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by imagery? Oh, just, you know, you're, you're hearing one thing, but you're thinking another. Mm -hmm. Multitasking, fatigue, projection of voice. You mean multitasking like people like on their cell phones? Like something like that, yes. yes. <laughs> um, Technology distraction. <laughs> levels of comprehension it might be educational uh -huh. differences or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Body language, I think that might have been mentioned before. Unprepared speaker, mm -hmm. I guess unprepared audience too. Let me see, pseudo listening. Did I say that when I thought that was a great expression, Jerry? Pseudo, pseudo listening. Pseudo listening. That's interesting. What do you mean by that? It's like when you're listening to someone, you're really half listening. Uh -huh. You're not present in the moment because you're thinking about what they're going to say before. So it's more about, you're thinking more about you than the person you're talking to. You're thinking about your response. Correct. Rather than. Correct. And, and one, one more, generation. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, you got that. Y versus X, Y, Z, <laughs> and versus and P. Right. So I think you, I think those are all really good. I have some of those, and you have a lot more for me to add to my next presentation. So here's my cool dog. Isn't he cute? So why do people have difficulties? Well, let me give you now what I've come up with, and. We, Maybe we can talk a little bit about each one because I, 
you've mentioned them. So the first one that you said, and it's just moved, and moved is accents. accents. So what do you mean by, let, let's just think about that for a minute. What kind of accents? Indian accent. Regional accent. Regional, yeah, regional okay. Regional or language. Or language. Uh, as you know, I worked in, abroad for many years, so this was often a problem. You get somebody speaking up there with a strong accent. And even, it doesn't necessarily mean they're from non-English speaking countries. When you speak to Irish, Scots. Boston. Boston. Wait a minute. <laughs> I mean, we all know Chicagoans have the best accent. I'm sorry. I wouldn't a lot of people have difficulty understanding Southern drawl. Yeah. Yeah. When I first w was living in Egypt, I was so happy because my neighbors across the hall were from America. I hadn't lived with Americans in 15 years, so I had five guys from Texas living across the hall. <laughs> and they invited my husband, who's, who was French, he's still French, but he's not my husband anymore, <laughs> over for dinner, and we played cards. And they taught us card games. And we said, uh, we went home, I said, oh, wasn't that great? We have these Americans. He said, I couldn't understand a word they said all night. <laughs> so it's true, even, and he spoke really good English. So it's, the accent is really a big thing. So if you're speaking, and you're speaking to an audience who doesn't have the same accent as you do, what do you do? Slow down. Slow. Yeah, slow down, speak clearly, and maybe use slides for the key words. And that, some, I think somebody said vocabulary. From this, I'm talking about people who might not know the same English speakers, let's just talk about English speakers, but who don't use the same slang, colloquial expressions, depending on where you're from or, or where you're brought up. Or even if you have people in your audience, what if you're speaking to a bunch of foreigners and you say, that's really cool. What do you think they might think? Right. They could be thinking about temperature. So these are things that I came up against all the time living abroad. And I think you mentioned this too, lack of shared knowledge. So this is what we're always talking about when we say know your audience. If, you're, if I'm going to speak about, for example, brain fitness, and if I'm speaking to neurologists, I'm not going to use the same vocabulary if I'm speaking to people who never studied anything about the brain. And I think that's something we have to really, really keep in the back of our minds. We have, Brian is in a Francophone club, and we have, we have some interesting language issues going on because sometimes we use a badly translated word or we don't know what the other person's talking about because we just, they're, they're like in another world. We have one guy who's really in another world. <laughs> but he's wonderful. Okay, then, then I, did, I think you mentioned technical problems too. What are some of the technical problems that you might have aside from this kind of thing? Microphone. Microphone. Speakers. Projector. Projector. I Cell think phone going off. Physical phone phone. Yeah. yeah. Deafness. Deaf, well, yeah, I guess Those that could be out. a tech. I'm thinking, well, hearing aids that don't work. Right. For example, I, I'm having that problem right now, training people in retirement homes. But we have this great program, and there's a guy over here. He said, "Why'd you say Jerry?" <laughs> His name's Jerry too. And he said, "I don't know, Seymour. What did you say?" You know. And so we decided the next time they were sitting next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I thought about was wrong assumptions. What do you think I mean by that? Might be the speaker might be assuming that the audience understands the context or the nature of the speech and the audience doesn't. Exactly. Are they on the same subject? Are we all talking about the same thing? And do we have the same train of thought? And are we on the same wavelength? Who was at uh, Jerry Rose's speech a little while ago? He said something that really, to me, I'm saying, well, that is really an American thing. That would never happen in France. He started out his speech by saying, what's the first thing you ask people? Anyone remember? What do you do? What do, you do? What do, you do? Well, that is the last thing you'd ever ask a French person. That would be considered the height of rudeness to say, hi, what's your name, what do you do? You might ask them, 
after the cheese course or during the dessert course. Mm -hmm. And you would definitely preface it by saying, excuse me for being so indiscreet, but may I ask you what you do? And you would only do it if they'd mentioned their work before in some slight way, like my boss said this. Or that. So I thought that was a very interesting comment he made, looking at it from an American point of view. But what if he goes to France and does the same speech? Nobody, nobody will get it. His, the, he, that right then and there, you know, he's lost the whole room. So those are things. To, has anyone spoken before an international audience? Mm -hmm. yeah. So these are things you have to know. You, when we say know the audience, it's really knowing the audience. Also knowing. I don't know. It's not. I guess it's not in here. But knowing what state they're in. If they've just come from a three-course lunch and they've had five glasses of wine, <laughs> you better do something to wake them up because otherwise you've got people sleeping. <coughs> what do you think I mean by different cultural or individual references? You sort of touched on that. Well, the cultural thing you were kind of just talking about, so there's other countries that are more relationship-based, and so you have to come at things from a different perspective, whereas like in America, things are much more direct. Um, and not so much relationship based. Any other ideas on that? Are you talking about individual references when you reference somebody in speech or in? It could be a person. Mm -hmm. I mean, your individual reference to something. Oh. I used to do a workshop with, I used to have 50 teachers that was in, that were in my team from all over the world. And most of them I, were English speakers. And we did different workshops. And one day I said to them, draw bread. Now, if I just ask you to imagine the word bread, what do you imagine? Can you describe it? Yeah. Loaf of bread. OK, how, what does it look like? Uh, it would be white and have, you'd see the crust at the top. Would it I be guess long some flour or short? On it. Yeah, it'd be about 10 inches long and 8 inches tall. Okay, eight That's inches. Flour. So like an American loaf, would it yeah, be sliced? Yeah, it'd be sliced. Okay, how would you imagine bread? <laughs> um, we just had lasagna the other night, so we had like a, an Italian loaf that was long, um, pretty broad, and then sliced up. So that's your first image. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your name? Gosh. Oh, gosh. Are you from India? Yes. So what would you think of when I say bread? What's your first, very first image? Now, since they've already talked about no, it. No, but before that, <laughs> if, you, if I just said bread, have yeah, and a simple white structure with okay. maybe a loaf of bread. Yeah. Okay, so you, you've become really American. <laughs> you wouldn't think of like a round, flat bread. <laughs> no. Yeah, I would think of a naan. A naan, yeah. <laughs> what so, what I, so what if I were doing a speech on bread? Every single person in this room would have a slightly different image in their minds. And I think that's a really interesting idea. Because bread is something we would think everybody knows what, it, what bread is. But well, I remember one time doing this exercise with teachers, and guess what a guy from Ireland wrote? I said, you know, draw bread. No, he drew money. No. Okay, so. <laughs> bread, you know. That, and so I think these are things we don't think about very much when we're doing a speech, because if we think it's just, and here we are, all Americans, or living in America, maybe eating the same kind of bread every day, but we won't have the same image. So what can you do? What's the solution? You could describe it. And show it. Show it. Yeah, this is a great thing for props. Maybe ask the crowd like you did here. <laughs> show, give, yeah, ask them. I would them. give you another idea of how to develop so, it. So that's what I mean by cultural references. And that's just a simple thing that we all have in common, more or less. So you can imagine if you're talking about something more complex, how confusing it might be if they get their first image completely off from yours. Now, unexpected consequences. This might not be in a presentation situation. Arguments? Okay, you could have an argument. You could be saying something and they come back. Like, you know, you think you're right in them. Okay. But I was thinking, I, one thing I thought of is, let's say you're calling somebody, and you're sure they're home, and you have something important to tell them. And
and the answering machine picks it up. You might not be, you might not be ready for that answering machine. Have you ever got a message from someone that you're like, what are they talking about? Because okay, you maybe didn't understand the words, or maybe they were in a noisy place. And so I think that's a big thing that we have to think about. The consequence, I thought they were going to understand, but they didn't. Because there was noise, because it was an answering machine, because of all these different things. And I think somebody said, not focusing on the situation. Obviously, if you're speaking to people who, and you see them kind of wandering off, you lost them. So what can you do? You're up there doing a presentation, and you notice that people aren't really listening. Change your vocal variety. Give, give your, raise your voice, or walk to individual people. Okay. Ask questions. Ask, ask questions. questions. Mm -hmm. Maybe bring in a story. Maybe bring in a story. Stories seem to bring people back. Yeah, that's a good idea. Flashlights. Flashlights. Flash <laughs> Another thing you can do, has anyone here a teacher? Well, one thing you can do when people stop listening to you is stop talking. Mm -hmm. Watch what happens if I'm silent. Or look for control under the table. Yeah. Like what? Tell them you're looking for control. All right. <laughs> what do I do with that control? Yeah, <laughs> but silence works really well because all of a sudden people start looking around and 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 then you can say, okay, I was just waiting for you to finish your conversation. You know, I, can I go on now? But you, you could, if you say it with a smile and a laugh right. in a nice way, it works. Okay, and you said this one: lack of shared knowledge. Obviously, if you come in for, I mean, we're all Toastmasters. We all know a lot of basic things. So when we're talking to Toastmasters, we're on the same wavelength, and we have a certain vocabulary that we share, too. We're like a family. If we say CC, everybody knows what that means, unless they're a really new Toastmaster. And then they find out quick, because they keep hearing everybody talk. It's like learning a new language. So if, if you're talking to people who are Toastmasters, and you're maybe t teaching them about how to make a presentation, if you start saying, well, they have vocal variety, blah, 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 they might not know what you're talking about. So you have to think about that. And that this is the last one I came up with. I didn't hear you say this. Yeah, body language. Body language. Well, if you're out of sync, with, if you're speaking and you're out of sync, let's say I'm standing up here crying and telling jokes. I'm really sending a mixed message to you. So you ha I think you have to be really careful about your body language. You know, you when you start like going like this, or <laughs> this you know, and, and people start looking at what you're doing, or if you're really nervous. I remember one time I was training a French guy who was in. He was a, a, se a seller, a salesman for his company, and so he's doing this great sales pitch, but the whole time he's going like this with his hands, you know. And I said, you look like you're counting that money before you even sign the contract. <laughs> And I didn't, I couldn't hear anything he was saying. And I had filmed, no, I'm not doing that. I didn't film, unfortunately, that day. So he saw it over again, and he did say, oh, yeah, you're right. So these little things we have to pay attention to. So my conclusion is being able to, under, to understanding an accent or knowing the vocabulary is only part of comprehension. These are things we have to be aware of, even when we're speaking our own language. All these other problems can, can arise. And when you're preparing something that you want to communicate to someone, you really have to think carefully about that. The next thing I wanted to talk about just for a few minutes is, and we can, we can go, can we everybody say five minutes and over? Is I, what I call one way or two way listening. Anyone have any idea what I'm talking about? Oh, yes. It's a give and take. Yeah. What? Okay. I mean, I mean, if it's I mean, just a one-sided conversation, then either the other person isn't really paying attention, or you're boring them to death. You know, death by monotone, but there's no feedback. There's no response. Okay. 
when you're only listening and not understanding, that's probably one way. And when you're listening as well as understanding. Okay, I haven't, yeah. You haven't got my idea yet, so you see it's important to find out. So the audience needs to listen to the speaker, but the speaker needs to pick up on the nonverbal cues of the audience, essentially listening to them and seeing if they're getting the message that's being conveyed. So one way might be, um, it's not too different from what some others have said, but I think the one way would be if you're just receiving a lecture. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. That's what, that, that was my idea. I knew somebody would figure it out. So for me, one way of listening is when you're, you have no possible response and no possible interaction. So what are some of those situations? It's working great, Paul. Thank you. I just need to get something out of my bag, that's all. Okay. What are some situations that you might be in where you are a, the, the listener to a one-way communication? Radio. Radio. Or if you're at a formal speaking event, you may not have the opportunity for a feedback or response to anything that's being spoken Yeah, symposium. Right. Like, like today, with Jerry Rose. We really couldn't make any comments. Otherwise, I would have still told up and stood up and told him. Somebody <laughs> did. Somebody said not, not in other countries or something like that. They yelled at us. Oh, well, it was probably me. My <laughs> subconscious. <laughs> Well, sometimes you see people arguing with each other, and they're really engaged in one-way communication because there's really no give and take. It's no, just that's true. delivering their own monologue simultaneously. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that, but that's very true. Neither of them is listening. But this is this I'm really thinking that one person is listening. So TV, radio, presentations. I have two, two more. One a big Toastmaster. TV, radio, movies. Nobody said movies. No. Okay, you associate it with TV. I would say webinars. Webinars, okay. So all of these forms where you're just YouTube and you're just sitting there listening. Um, conferences, pre during a presentation. And what do we do in Toastmasters all the time when we're passive listeners? Evaluating. Evaluating. But I would rather that you are active listeners. And so I have this idea about information gathering. So when you have a one that's, a, when you're in a one-way listening situation, what can you do to facilitate your comprehension? Ask questions. It's one way. Oh. Take notes. You could I'm thinking of ahead of time. I'll give you a clue. Before you get into that situation, do some background research yeah. on the topic that's being spoken of. Okay, so mm -hmm. so that's you know prepare what prepare to listen. How often do we prepare to listen? We prepare to speak, but we don't always prepare to listen. So decide what you want to know. Did anyone prepare to listen to Jerry Rose? Go on LinkedIn. You can go on LinkedIn and find out who he is. What do you think he's going to be talking about? We can do a little research. You can prepare just by reading that handout that they gave us. Who read the handout on Jerry Rose before you went into here? Okay, so you're more prepared. You already have an idea of who he is and what he might be talking about. And if you're at a presentation, there are two things I, I suggest that you listen carefully to if you want to take something home with you. Kind of a formal presentation, a one-way presentation. What do you think? Where is that? Where are those two spots where uh, a speaker can really get the message across? Introduction and conclusion. Exactly. Exactly. If you, and I tell people this who are foreigners, I say, if you're listening to something in English, or if you're English and listening to it in another language, if you can really listen to the introduction, at least you know where they're going. Mm -hmm. And if the speaker's good, even if you didn't understand everything, they should sum up their main points at the end. So at least you can take that home with you. What if you're going to a meeting where you might not be that active, but you're sort of listening in? You, what can you do before you go? Find out about 
what the meeting's about. Right. You can read the agenda, for example. So you're ready. You're, this is a ways you can prepare yourself to listen. And if the, the last thing that I thought of, whoops, I don't know why it came out one, because on my paper it says four, but anyway, <laughs> this is technology for you. <laughs> listen for stressed words. So if you're listening to somebody speak, usually they will stress the words that are the most important to them, right? Like, where are we going tomorrow? Or where are we going tomorrow? So you might not be listening to your own language, but at least you can get those key words. And then when you, that means, of course, when you're a speaker, you have to think about that too, if you're trying to get your message across. So listening, two-way listening, here I'm thinking about having a conversation, and this is where you're able actually to question or to clarify or to reformulate. Can you think of some situations that might be? Right here. Right here. Right here, right now. So like a workshop kind of situation. That's the first one. <laughs> it should say one. It does. What other situations have you been in where you actually have this kind of give and take? Board meetings. Board meetings. Family dinner table. Family dinner, yes. It's very important. They're not on my list, but I do have meetings. I have classes, meetings. And then I thought of two more. Just any individual conversation that you have that's more like one-on-one. -on -one. Exactly, any one-on-one -on -one situation. The end of a presentation where you, some you can have questions, some you can't. And I was thinking about debates, too, like political debates and things like that. They're, they really, really have to listen to each other carefully. Is that, do you have, does anyone have any questions about that? Do you agree with me? Mm -hmm. So here's where I came up with the idea. We had information gathering, so that's preparing ahead of time when you're going into a one-way listening situation where you're getting ready to listen. And this is what I call conversation guiding. What do you think I mean by that? Somebody wants to get off track, you kind of lead it, steer it back to the main point. How do you do that? You could just say, well, maybe we'll talk about that later. You can ask me questions later. Or oh. That's okay. a good point, and I would like to get back to the main point. Okay. What else can you do to guide a conversation? Uh, you might say, if it's in a board meeting or something, you know, that might be committee work. Let's bring that back to the committee. Okay. I was thinking of things like interrupting. Let's say you because it's a two-way thing. So if you don't understand what I'm saying, you can interrupt me. That's a way better. And once you've interrupted me, then you might... Ask a question. And what if, I, I get five extra minutes, we said, right? Did you count those in? No. Oh, okay. sorry, no. <laughs> okay. So another thing you might do is reformulate to clarify what you said. So we've all heard this before in different workshops. I think it's sometimes we forget. If I understand what you're saying, blah, 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 blah. If I understand what you're saying, we have five more minutes from now, even though we started right and then I think there are situations where we really want to take control of a situation. So if you're speaking to somebody who you don't understand, you can ask them to slow down. You can ask them to define a word you didn't hear or you don't understand. You can ask them to repeat. And for me, that's taking control. It's not being a controller, but it's allowing you to understand and hear what they're saying. In conclusion, when you're the speaker, I would say be sure your audience will understand you by thinking about all these potential problems that could come up. I think when we say know your audience, it's really not enough. We really have to think about all these things we were talking about before, from accent to cultural differences. And when you're the listener, I challenge you to practice your listening in two way, in, in the, both of these situations, both one way and two way. 
And I thank you for coming to and bearing with me with all these technical problems. And I really appreciated all of your input. Thank you very much. Joanne, thank you so much for a great presentation. And I, I learned so much out of this just as I think about our world has become much more global in the interactions that we've had. Just the computers have helped us with that. So just hearing some of these tips from an interaction that I might have from picking up a cup of coffee at Starbucks or to making a phone call to get some customer service support. These are some things that I can certainly take away. So thank you thank so you. much for a great session. And here's a certificate. And for your next presentation, this is like a laser clicker that you can use to point to your presentation to specific thank points. You. So thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. There are evaluation forms, so please do fill that out. I will collect those at the end. And there's a sign-up sheet that was being routed as well. Thank you very much.